ought to be an interesting talk. We met at, what was that? Come on up here. Was it uh, DRI? And uh, your company does like failure analysis. And I go, hey, you guys need some drones. And they said, you know what? We already tried that. And I said, let me guess. These people couldn't deliver the data that you wanted. And they were like, so I said, you know, I need to get somebody like you that could talk about this at our expo. And here she is. So please welcome Karen Rimmett. Good morning. Thank you to Patrick for having me. We're going to get down on the, uh, we heard from Young about the kind of the overview of the industry. I deal with the physical system, so I'm an electrical engineer. My MBA is in global strategic management, and I deal with fail failure analysis primarily for startups in that they need to craft compliance programs, oftentimes for prototypes that have never been seen on earth. That's really tough because compliance is, it's a two-fold program. It gives you feedback for your design team about where you can make systems better, and it also helps you with risk mitigation. So if something goes terribly wrong and someone's affected by your failed product, you wanna have that kind of fundamental underpinning that you did some regulatory testing and that certain parts or components or the system itself meets some sort of safety standards or um, physical integrity standards. So that's kind of where I work. And I also, mo I would say 60% of my workload at any given time as a consultant is that I, call, I get called in on tactical issues when things have gone terribly wrong. So a lot of times people don't want to call me because that means something's terribly wrong. They've had a catastrophic failure. And after we clean up the mess and fix it and give design feedback to the engineers, and I go away, they never want to admit that they ever talked to me. So it's kind of um, more of a tactical and legal ex uh, expertise that I can lend. Today I've just got three points. If your eyes start glazing over, I'll move along. It's a big topic, so failure analysis engineering is where I live. There's a, a system level overview, and then there's an algorithm that I perform regardless of whether I'm looking at batter battery chemistry density or an electronic system that failed for a control, or a computer chip, or even a radio. Maybe the radio controls failed on one of your unmanned systems. So the algorithm is the same approach each and every time. You do failure analysis on a physical system on Earth, but it just depends on the uh, report of failure and the surrounding circumstances where we start. So the first thing we're going to talk about is putting up is the, the categoriz categorization of failures, um, what I do in the legal framework. Then I'm going to show you how to put up some walls when you think about this stuff, because it can be one big blob when something catches on fire, drops out of the sky, and causes a roof to, to burn. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the business considerations as well. The reason I wanted to do the overview and the framework is because a lot of times design engineers and people involved with uh, initial prototypes, initial products, are not familiar with the failure analysis framework. And I want to make sure we're not coming at this from a design perspective. That's a very different perspective. So when designers work, let's say there's a safety standard that allows you to push on this with with 50 pounds of side pressure. It ha this has to withstand 50 pounds of side pressure. So the designers make it withstand 50 pounds and go, we're done, we did it. What I do is push on it until it breaks. And then we see, was that 51 pounds? Was it 500 pounds? After it breaks, what are the effects? Did shards shoot off of it? Did it go up in flames? Did it self-extinguish? How long was the failure effect? Um, active. So the kinds of things I do are not intuitive to designers and people who are driving innovation. The legal framework I tend to work in for a catastrophic failure is a design defect. And by the legal definition in tort law, products liability law, where I work, the design defect just means that the design is inherently dangerous, not the manufacturing, 
and not the user mistakes, but the design itself. And the classic example from law school and tort law classes is whether or not if you run around the house with a steak knife and you get cut, is that a design defect? And the, court, the courts in the US have ruled in uh, tort law thousands of times on this. No, it's not because if you made it less sharp, then it wouldn't do its job. So design defect just means if the product can do its job, the inherent dangers have to be worn, but they can't be taken out or it would be useless. A manufacturing defect, you look at the functional spec that the designers came up with, and you try to figure out if, it's effect, if the whole batch is affected for one date code, or whether or not the assembly materials like glues and things like that are defective or contaminated. And then foreseeable product, product abuse, I call it silly user tricks. So you just wanna see if it's reasonable. Tort law in the civil litigation community is based on the standard of reasonableness. What would a reasonable person do, for instance, with a heating pad? Would you plug it in, duct tape it to your body and jump in a swimming pool? No, that's not foreseeable abuse. Lying down on a heating pad and getting shocked or burned would be foreseeable abuse because it's a therapeutic heat. So those are the kinds of areas I work in with my clients, especially with um, prototypes and startup companies. They need to be aware of all the legal ramifications of each design decision and whether or not it can be categorized one of these three ways. For the failure analysis, the FA is failure analysis, tips and techniques. What we really have to do in FA, especially getting called in for catastrophic failure, I have to put up walls. You have to look at available energy for the fault. You have to look at the failure mode if you can get to it. And a lot of times when there's fire explosion, you can't get to the failure mode, it's burned up. And then you have to separate the failure mode from the effects of the failure. And that's the place where it's really hard to do. And you have to really study this a lot to get it. So the first wall that you have to put up as an engineering company or as engineering designers or teams or venture capitalists, you have to set aside your emotions. And it's really hard to do. I was a designer for several years. And when you make your baby come into the world and it's functioning and it's beautiful and then something bad happens, the first thing people wanna do is panic and blame. You want to blame somebody else or you want to shift the blame to an uh, upstream supplier. So you have to set aside those emotions to do good failure analysis. And then you have to put the wall up, as I just alluded to, between the failure itself and the effects of that failure. And to do this, we have a process flow called the scientific method. If you've ever been involved in science fairs or judge science fairs, we teach it to kids in science programs. And it's just one hypothesis, a way to measure your guess. A hypothesis is just a guess. And then you measure it, and then you go on and do iterations of that, changing one, var one variable at a time. This works really well when you're trying to get at root cause. So back to the emotional language part. I worked on a case one time I'm going to give you. Um, when products fail, people get really panicky because they're spectacular a lot of times. In unmanned systems, they can fall out, of the, fall out of the sky burning. They're heavy. They can light things on fire. They can crash. There goes your profit margins, having to figure it out and repair it. So when people get panicky and don't understand something intuitively, they get really emotional. And um, I was working with a multinational recently where the customer comment on a field return was, you almost burned my house down and my family almost died. So they called me in and they were like, what do we do, what do we do? We almost killed these people. I'm like, well, okay, well let's look at the science first before we jump to that. And um, what happened was in this case, there was a small five volt um, transformer, a wall wart. They had plugged it in to charge something that flies. I can't go into the details of the brand but there had been a short between power and ground traces. It started a small localized fire. It breached the plastic housing. There was not enough available energy to sustain the fault, so it fused open. And um, you, here, let me see if I have this slide next. There's a picture of the ultimate failure. It fused open, it breached the case, little puff of smoke, and it self-extinguished. 
So I'm sorry, no, it didn't almost burn your house down. It self-extinguished within less than 30 seconds. And there wasn't even very much smoke because it was contained in the plastic housing. So that's the kind of correction we have to do to the emotional language using science and engineering. The engineers um, that do failure analysis, like my teams and I, you have to make a distinction between failure and effects. That's the other wall I wanted to talk about putting up. You can't both replicate root cause and study field failure effects at the same time because you lose the patterns. A lot of times we look at the effects, we say, did it self-extinguish like I just showed you? Was there fire? How long was the fire sustained? How hot did it get based on the combustible combustible surrounding materials. And what happened to the people that were involved? Did somebody have smoke inhalation? Did they get burned? Did buildings go, did anybody lose their lives? So you look at the failure effects first and then you kind of backtrack into root cause. So it's much easier to form a hypothesis if you study the effects in depth and then backtrack. Then you replicate the effects and some root causes are automatically ruled out if something catches on fire, for instance, it's a very different scenario than when it doesn't. So you can backtrack into root cause. And then when you uh, create a lab failure, you don't have all the information. All the information I had on the failed power supply was you almost killed me. That was it. I'm sorry, that's not science. I can't really, I could replicate almost killing you, but it wouldn't be the same thing. So yeah, we have to be really careful with emotions and failure effects and then backtracking into root cause as well. This is the scientific method, it's all over the internet. You can Google scientific method and you'll get 50 charts like this, so it's pretty self-explanatory. I know a lot of people in the room are business people, so I don't wanna go into um, all the details of speaking geek and you know, put you to sleep, but you can look it up online if you like. Uh-oh, where's Patrick? Yeah. Do the software troubleshooting here. Okay. No, I think uh, I think that Microsoft wants something from you. Actually. Yeah, they probably want more money out of me. <laughs> they do. Hold on, let me. Uh, Thank you. Um, let's see if we can find you here. Is this you here? Perfect. Yeah. Do you remember where you were? Yeah. Okay. Let me start the show. Thank you. We had a failure. Yeah, we had a failure. All part of the time. Thank you. We were just through scientific method. There we go. So I want to give you another case study that's better. The stories are always better than the dry science, I think. I had a board, a circuit board come in. It was a controller board for a system. And um, they saw a, a higher than normal return rate. So the field failure rate was edging up to 15% when they called me. And they were saying that the CPU was glitchy. The CPU was not performing the way the, the computer chip or the brains of the operation was not performing the way it was spec'd or designed. But I think after looking at the material, my hypothesis was it wasn't the CPU. It was more likely a manufacturing defect. And the reason I thought that was the product had been in field use for three and a half years and the CPU had been in use in various uh, iterations. It was a Motorola slash Freescale CPU that was used in cars, tractors, all kinds of controllers. So the CPU was stable in the market for many years. So I doubted that it was a bad batch of CPUs, frankly, across multiple date codes and multiple builds. So we put the wall up and we stopped guessing at the root cause and we just looked at the effects. And the intermittent faults on the controller board were really glitchy and funny, so we wanted to look at a common cause across the whole board. So we traced all the clocks, all the data, all the power paths on the uh, circuit board, both on a couple of units that were behaving badly and on some known good units. And we did a comparison. And what we came up was, 
with was the glue that somebody had used on some of these batches had changed. So once something's in production for a while, manu outsourced manufacturing tends to cost reduce the build. They were using water-based glue straight out of an open glue pot on the shop floor instead of RTV, which has um, good dielectric strength and good heating strength. So in this water-based glue, we saw it was bridging across clock data and processor signals, so and control signals. So um, we went there first because that was common to all the signals we were seeing that weren't very uh, that weren't that were behaving badly. So we took a photograph first. This is just the process we walked through. I did this with one of my clients' engineers. Oftentimes, I just go into engineering and work side by side with their engineers. So we took a photograph of interest. I thought there was potential ionic contamination. Ionic contamination is just a track that the railroad train of electrons can run on. And a lot of times, if you have one of those unwanted paths, it causes unwanted digital signals on a board. We used a scanning electron microscope to isolate some spots on the glue. And then we shot it in EDS. It's an x-ray um, machine where you pump the chamber down and you look very carefully at the energy bands you shoot it with um, particles, you get the energy bands back and it tells you what elements are there. In this one, you'll see the, I don't know if you can see it very well, but the little green arrows show sodium chloride. Anytime you see sodium chloride, it's a salt and it's in water. So this means this was wet and it left salts that are conductive. That's the ionic contamination piece that was causing unwanted currents and making the signals behave badly. So all they ended up having to do is change the glue they didn't do a recall. They warned customers. Sometimes you can use language on the website or in the marketing material. So we proved that it was a manufacturing defect, not a design defect in the CPU. The product life cycle was long in the market, and the CPU was found to be working properly. And then the outcome was they just had to change the glue back to RTV as originally specified by the designers. So a lot of times at the end of the study, you go, wow, we did all this for that. We just changed glue. But the process to get there can be very convoluted sometimes. So the business, I'll just wrap up with the business considerations real quick. Look at your product life cycle. A lot of you guys are working in the introduction phase or prior. You're still in R&D with some of the systems you're dealing with. At that case, you're changing prototypes very rapidly. You're, you're moving variables five at a time without taking the time to circle back and figure out if I pull this lever, how does it affect upstream and downstream pieces of your system or sub-assemblies? I recommend that you do that when you can. I know budgets are tight and time is close. But if you can do that, you really need to see one variable at a time and all the downstream effects. One of the ways that I do that with my startup companies is to just vary one variable and then send it back through a standard metric test recipe. So you should have systems tests that you can do quickly and easily. You should write them down, and you should execute them every single time you change a variable to see if each point gets better or worse. If you want to ever call me or email me and just chat informally, I love this stuff, so it's fine. Oh, no, it did it again. The other, I'll just go on. The business consideration that I wanted to talk about is bad press. So I have an MBA, and part of strategy is keeping the bad press down when you do have catastrophic failure. So I was working with a silicon manufacturer in Silicon Valley one time, and the engineers got emotional. That's why I said put up the walls. And the, the press got a hold of the failures. You, you want to put it back here. up? Yeah, okay. I'll try and put it. You, you keep speaking. Thank you. The press got a hold of the failures, and um, the stock plummeted. So they almost went out of business because they had a catastrophic failure and couldn't contain their emotional language. Therefore, people started making more and more mistakes. The water cooler gossip got really negative. They had people leaving. Their most experienced people left. And then it was left to the excitable junior engineers as a skeleton crew, all because of one batch of failures. And they didn't need to go down like that in flames. So I would just encourage you to think carefully about your catastrophic failures along your path, and you will have some, if you, whether you're a multinational or you're a, a prototype startup, you will have some catastrophic failures of phys physical systems. I just encourage you to put those walls up, 
and just make sure that the emotion stays out, that you look at the effects, worst case effects, and you try to trace it back thoughtfully to what you can change one variable at a time. And like I said, I love talking about this stuff. I do it for a living, so I see a lot of, um, I, there's the take home point I was just trying to make. I see a lot of failures across batteries, different chemistry, chemistry density, electronics failures, and radio failures. So if you guys just ever want to chat, you don't have a budget for consulting, that's fine with me. We'll just email back and forth. And there is my email and my mobile phone. Thank you. <laughs>